I want to introduce you to what we mean by security, computer security, network security, give a few definitions, and then uh, talk about some of the concepts that we use when we talk about securing computer systems. Uh, hopefully we'll finish this today, we may get on to the next one, but just a light introduction to security. Some definitions, what other people think of uh, what is security. The first one comes from a, a, an organization called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US. They are an, uh, an organization, a government organization that creates standards in the US, but they produce a lot of standards about how companies and, and, and people should use computer security. They say computer security is the protection afforded to automated information system in order to obtain the applicable objectives of preserving integrity, availability and confidentiality of information system resources. So a long definition. What can we pick out there? Okay, so we want to protect some computer system, an automated information system. And protect it to attain some objectives. So we're going to see that we need to have some objectives. If I have a computer system, then from a security perspective, we'll have some objectives of what we want to achieve with that system and how do we want to keep it secure. And we'll arrive at uh, talking about security policies uh, in one of the later slides. And we want to preserve, for that computer system, preserve the integrity availability and confidentiality of information or information system resources, not just information, resources. Resources include, for example, the, the processing and the memory resources on the computer, network resources, as well as files, that information. So another definition before we look more depth at these uh, parts. This is about, the first one is about computer security. So generally about securing computer systems. Computer systems include securing a standalone computer, like a laptop, or a server, or a mainframe, or a TV. Where they may also include uh, collections of computers, so a network of computers. But sometimes security of computer networks is treated separately than securing a computer. So there's a lot of overlap, but sometimes the techniques we use to secure my computer on its own may be slightly different from what I use to secure the communications between my computer and another computer across a network. Here's another definition of network and internet security. So communications across a network, how do we keep them secure? Well, the measures we use to deter, prevent, detect and correct security violations that involve transmission of information. You're all experts on data communications. It's about getting information from one point to another, transmitting information across a network. So, so if there are security violations, that is when we transfer information across the network, something goes wrong with respect to security, then we want to look at, well, how do we stop such violations? Uh, and in some case fix and detect them. So de to deter violations, that is to make people not want to violate the security of my network, to prevent them, to make it impossible for someone to violate the security of my network. Detect is if someone does violate the security that I at least know that it happened. And correct is, okay, if, if something is violated in my network then I can fix it. So we'll see that prevention and detection usually go together. These are just two definitions of computer security and network and internet security. The second one is from your course textbook. It's by William Stallings called Cryptography and Network Security. Uh, this is the fifth edition. There's a sixth edition I think just released. Um, if you're going to buy a textbook, buy this one. 
but you see the thick handout that I give you, you, you may survive without it. <laughs> but it is a good textbook that covers all the things that we cover in this course. So let's look at some of these things in more depth. So some of it may not make sense yet. In the definition of computer security, there was, we want to preserve integrity, availability, and confidentiality. And those are three concepts that come up quite often talking about security. Confidentiality, integrity, availability, CIA. Okay, not the organization, but the combination of these three concepts. Well, confidentiality is keeping things secret, keeping information confidential. I think that's what many people think of when they think about computer and network security. You send a file to someone else, you don't want someone in the middle to intercept and read that, the contents of that file. You want to keep it secret, you want to keep it confidential. So that's a common thing that we need in computer systems to keep information confidential. Integrity is making sure that the information or the system is not modified in some way. An example, and we'll see some other examples later, but one common one is that we want to send data to some destination even if we allow it to be seen by people, that is, we don't care about confidentiality, I don't care if someone reads my message, I would still like it such that no one could modify the message along the way. So that I send a message to you, the message that you receive is identical to the one that I sent. That is about in the integrity of the message, the integrity of the information. If I send a message to you, but someone malicious modifies that message along the way, and you receive the modified message, that can be a security violation. So integrity is also important. The last one in this triangle is availability. And that often refers to the availability of a computer system or a computer network. The purpose of computer systems, computer networks, is to provide some service to the users. Okay, a server, a web server, is so that people can, can access the, the files on that web server. An email server, so that they can send emails. A security violation of a computer system may be making that system unavailable for the normal users to use. So, for example, Amazon has a web server. You go there to buy things. See, if someone violates the security of the Amazon web server such that you can no longer go there to buy things, that can be considered a security attack because uh, the availability of the Amazon web server is uh, well, it's no longer available. So we treat this as an important security issue, making sure the computer system is available. In the case of Amazon, if their web server is down for just a few seconds, then they're going to lose a lot of money. Okay, so it can have a, a significant impact if our computer system is not available because of a security violation. You may have heard of denial of service attacks, and that's the, the main form of attack on availability. So we'd like usually to have confidentiality, integrity, availability. Maybe not always all three, but there are three common concepts that we see in computer systems. There are others. Sometimes we distinguish between, also we identify authenticity. Making sure either the information or the people that we're communicating with are authentic. Someone sends you a message, the source says it's from Steve. You want to be sure that it's from Steve, it's not from someone pretending to be me. Okay, that's about authenticity. Accountability is to make sure that we can, uh, can track and, and keep monitor of what things happen and that we can 
track things back to who caused some particular event. We can hold them accountable. So a computer system or a computer network, we usually want to focus on making sure the information is confidential, it maintains its integrity, and we have availability of that system. We will not go too much into what happens when a computer system is compromised, but I think you can think of many examples. But how does a breach or a compromise of a computer system impact upon organizations? For example, SIT. We're an organization. What's our business? What's the business of SIT? Education. Education. Okay, so SIT makes money by educating people. So that's our business. What if there's some security attack on the SIT computer network uh, such that um, something goes wrong on the computers, on the servers, or, or some part of our network? Well, there can be different impacts on an organization, ranging from minor to, to catastrophic, very bad. So some examples. A common thing, if there is a security violation, is that the effectiveness of that organization is reduced. So the, the, the primary operation of SIT is education. We teach people. If, for example, someone does a, an attack on our network and they reboot this computer, like someone did in my lab yesterday, <laughs> then it's going to stop me from teaching for two or three minutes. It's going to reduce my effectiveness in our operation of education. Well, not so bad. You may enjoy the break for a few minutes. But you can imagine if someone did an attack such that they deleted all the files on my laptop, then that's also going to reduce my effectiveness because I'm going to have to recreate all my lecture notes and, and, and get backups and so on. So security breaches can reduce how well an organization operates. Sometimes it's just an inconvenience. Sometimes we'll lose money because of that. Okay? So you can think that if someone logs or uh, accesses SIT's network um, and manages to delete uh, a lot of confidential information, then recreating that and uh, uh, getting it from backups may cost us money. So we may lose money. There may be damage to real hardware, damage to assets. Uh, an example that happened uh, one or two years ago, maybe even a little bit earlier than that, was uh, an attack on some nuclear power plants in, in Iraq that uh, was basically some form of virus was installed on the computers inside the nuclear power plants and the idea was that it would cause some of the machinery there to operate uh, outside the normal specs. That it would operate uh, in, in an un unexpected way, such that the machini machinery would break down. And that effectively damaged that, the assets, it damaged hardware in that case. So it cannot just mean to loss of money, but we can lose equipment because of an attack. And maybe the worst case, it can start to harm individuals. Uh, in, in, you can imagine if a nuclear reactor is, uh, if there's uh, some attack on the computer system and that computer system controls the, the heating and the, and the cooling and so on, then the worst case is a, a meltdown. And of course that has a, a catastrophic impacts. So there's a wide range of impacts if a breach does occur. We're not going to talk much about them. I think you can think about different impacts from very low to, to very major impacts. In the topic on IT security, we, you, I, you don't, I cover more aspects of, well, how would organizations measure and predict what the impact of a particular violation would be? But we will not get into that in this course. This course is going to focus more about the network security part of, of, of computer security. So we want to try and arrive at
some definitions and some classification of the things that we need to consider in network and computer security. What's OSI? Anyone seen it before, the, the acronym? ISO backwards? <laughs> well, OSI, and remember last semester we talked about the five-layer TCP IP model. There was another one before that which was a seven-layer model called the Open Systems Interconnection, OSI model for communications. And the organization that created OSI is ISO. ISO created OSI. Why is it relevant here? In creating a model for communications in networks, one aspect they need to consider is security. Security of communications. And many years ago, they come up with some, some definition and models of, well, what do we need in terms of security in networks? So that's why we introduced this here, because it has a few nice definitions of, of network security. So we're not too concerned with uh, OSI, with ISO, and there's another organization, ITU, uh, who work with ISO. I'm not too concerned about that. I'm concerned about getting to some of the definitions and terminology that they introduced. Uh, this organization, it was ISO and ITU, created some definition of security and computer networks. And some aspects that they defined were they classified types of attacks, different security mechanisms, and the services that computer networks should provide to users to prevent the attacks. The aims of... Uh, the, the, well, how do we say that? The services that the users should, should be offered such that the network works correctly. Sometimes we distinguish between a threat and an attack on a computer system. A threat is a potential violation of security. So something may go wrong, that's a threat. So a threat could be that uh, someone uh, guesses the password of, of my login for SIT. An attack is when they actually do that. They carry out the threat. An attack may result in a violation. A threat is something that can go wrong. An attack is an attempt to carry out that threat, and the attack may be successful or not. So ISO, ITU created some definitions, and they spoke about a security attack, some action that attempts to compromise the security of information or facilities. So something that someone does that tries to defeat the security of information, for example, files or, or information that we store, or facilities like a computer, or parts of a computer, computer system or network. A threat is a potential for an attack to occur. So we may have security attacks on systems. Security mechanisms are the different methods that we have available to prevent attacks. And if we can't prevent them, to detect attacks. And if we detect them, to hopefully recover from attacks. Ideally, we'd like to prevent attacks, stop them from happening. But in practice, that may be impossible. So if an attack does happen, we'd like to at least be able to detect it and then do something about it. We will, towards the end of this topic, list a set of security mechanisms, and in fact, this course goes through those mechanisms. A service, we want to use a set of security mechanisms to enhance the security of our information or the security of our facilities to stop attacks. So I want to provide a service such that attacks are difficult or preferably impossible. So in the next few slides, we'll list first some attacks, or classify different types of attacks. Then we'll classify different types of services. And then in the rest of this course, we'll really look at the different types of mechanisms. And they'll all come together. Attacks. And this is 
related to computer networks, but a lot of it also applies to just standalone computers. A computer network is multiple computers uh, communicating with each other. First, we'll classify attacks as to either pa passive or active. And within passive, we'll see there are two types of attacks, releasing the message contents and traffic analysis. And in active attacks, there are four types, masquerade, replay, modification, and denial of service. We'll go through those six. So really, we have six types of attacks. Two are passive, four are active. Let's go through those six, and then we'll come back and compare active versus passive and explain them. These examples of attacks are from pictures from the textbook. And in a communication system, we have someone wanting to communicate data to someone else. So Bob wants to send data to Alice in this example. Bob and Alice are normal users of our communication system. So in this picture, this cloud represents our communications network. It's called a communications facility here. So the normal situation is, in this case, Bob sends a message to Alice. If there's no attack, then that's all that happens. Bob sends a message to Alice. Let's say Bob wants to keep that message secret, or private, or confidential. Bob's sending a message to Alice, and he doesn't want anyone else but Alice to see that message. Then a, an attack on that form of communications if there's another user, Darth in this case, our malicious user, the attacker, that somehow gets a copy of the message that Bob sends to Alice and is able to read the contents of that message. That is an attack on the communication system. And the, the name here is just releasing the message contents. That is, the message contents that Bob the contents of the message Bob sends to Alice is released to someone who shouldn't have it. And this is a common attack that people think of in security. That is, okay, we want to keep information confidential. Such an attack makes the confidential information uh, public or available to those that shouldn't have it. How do we stop such an attack? What mechanism do you think we have that we can stop such an attack? I'm sure you've heard of it. Again, I hear, all right, many answers, sorry. MD5 is what? Three letters, three, three letter acronym. A hash algorithm? No. We'll come back to a hash algorithm. We'll see it is used in some things. Uh, but it may be a simpler thing I think you've heard of. And you probably use it on a regular basis, but you may not see it. How do we keep messages secret? We encrypt them. Okay, That's all. That is, we use encryption. A cipher is just the name of uh, is what we call an algorithm, an, an encryption algorithm or an encryption cipher. So if Bob wants to send an a, a message to Alice across a network, such as the internet, then we normally assume that someone else may be able to see those messages being sent. Let's say my computer is Bob and Alice's computer is in the US. So when I send a message to Alice, then it travels through the SIT network, through the ISP inside Thailand to some ISP that connects uh, to Japan and then across the Pacific to the US and so on. So my data travels through many other people's networks. I don't trust them. It's very easy for someone who uh, owns and operates one of those networks to intercept the messages and see the contents of them. And in fact, if I send this through the SIT Wi-Fi, it would be very easy for you to sit here on your laptop or even mobile phone and intercept my message as I send it to the US. So, if Bob normally sends a message to Alice, then it's very easy for someone to intercept the message and get a copy of the message. 
So the way that we try to prevent such an attack is that before Bob sends the message, he encrypts the message and then sends the encrypted version of that message. Alice receives the encrypted version and Alice decrypts the message. And to decrypt, she must have some key. So there's some key that Alice needs to know, which usually Bob knows as well. So Bob and Alice have a, a shared secret key. Bob encrypts, sends to Alice, Alice decrypts and gets the original message back. Darth intercepts the encrypted message. Even though he can see the encrypted message, he cannot see the contents, the original message, unless he can decrypt that message. And to decrypt, he needs the key. So that's what encryption relies on, is making it hard to be able to decrypt a message without having the key, and then making sure that Darth cannot get the key. We'll spend several topics going through how encryption works. So that's one of the mechanisms, and a very common mechanism used in computer security is encryption. At this stage, we're just looking at some of the attacks. Let's say, I, let's say that Bob does encrypt his messages. He's got an encryption algorithm, and he, before he sends them, he, he encrypts them, and Alice can decrypt, Darth cannot. Okay. So then we prevent such an attack of releasing the message contents. But there's another type of attack that can occur called traffic analysis. In this case, Bob's, let's say, uh, Bob and Alice are not married. And late at night, Bob's sending messages to Alice, someone else's wife. And he shouldn't be, okay? Uh, he doesn't want other people, and both of them don't want other people to know that they're communicating late at night, okay? And they're smart. They encrypt their messages so that no one else can see that there are some love messages between Bob and Alice. But Darth still intercepts the messages Maybe Darth is the husband of Alice. <laughs> he intercepts the messages and he cannot see the contents. So he doesn't know what Bob and Alice are communicating. But he can realise that they are communicating at a particular point in time. And sometimes that's enough to be useful for an attack. To not realise what the contents are, but to realise that two entities are communicating at a particular point in time and maybe with a particular pattern. That is, every Saturday night they send a, a, a bunch of messages between each other. Or maybe from a different example, uh, a law enforcement agency is Darth, a police force or, or some other agency. They are monitoring communications between some criminals. Those messages are encrypted so they cannot see what the criminals are, uh, are communicating, but they can at least know that they are communicating, and maybe the pattern of communications leads to them working out that some other things are going to happen. Maybe a terrorist attack is going to happen in the future based on an increased frequency of messages between those uh, people. So analysing the communications without seeing the contents is also an attack. Encryption doesn't stop that. How do we stop that? How could your Bob or Alice, okay, what could you do such that Darth cannot work out any patterns of your behaviour based upon your communications? How would you hide the patterns of your behaviour? from someone who can easily monitor the communications. Encryption doesn't help. Encryption, Darth can't read the contents, but he can still see you're communicating at midnight, or you're sending a thousand messages between to a, a person that you shouldn't be. How can we hide that or stop that? Maybe I gave it away. 
You want to somehow hide the pattern of your communications. So assuming someone can monitor, maybe you want to send some messages, at, some fake messages at different points in time to hide the patterns. So instead of sending messages, a thousand messages every Saturday night, make some uh, pattern of communications that spreads the messages over time. So it's harder for the observer to observe any pattern in the communications. So there are some ways to try and hide the communications by introducing some extra messages or introducing some delay in your communications. Do not send the messages instantaneously, that is, uh, have them delayed over time. So that's the second form of attack. Consider both of these attacks. Look at the picture. Let's assume there was no attack. In this case, Darth wasn't there. Then the normal communications is that Bob sends a message to Alice. Let's say Bob sends one message. Alice receives one message. If there was no attack. So the normal users, Bob sends a message, Alice receives a message. When there is an attack, Bob sends one message, Alice receives one message. Nothing changes from Bob and Alice's perspective whether there's an attack or not. And that's what we call a passive attack. From the perspective of the system, of the normal users, the normal communications network, when we introduce the attack, nothing changes compared to the normal operation. With the attack, Bob sends one message, Alice receives one message. Without the attack, it's exactly the same. So the attack doesn't change the system operation. So we call that a passive attack. It's the same in this case. Let's say Bob sends 10 messages to Alice. In the case of no attack, Bob sends 10 messages, Alice receives 10 messages. If there is an attack, it's the same. Bob and Alice send and receive the same number of messages. It's just that Darth also receives them. So the attack doesn't modify the system operation or the system resources. These two are passive attacks. The next four are active attacks. You'll see that when the attack takes place, the normal behavior is different from the perspective of Bob and Alice. Masquerade. What does it mean, masquerade? Mask, to pretend, to pretend to be someone else in this case. To, to mask yourself or to pretend to be someone else in terms of network security. So this is an attack. Alice is, is the, 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 uh, uh, works in the accounting office and, and does the, the pay slips for everyone. And Bob is the employee, and, and uh, sorry, Bob is the, the director of SIT, and he issues commands to Alice to increase Steve's pay by 10,000 baht per month, or to decrease if I do a bad job. So normally, Bob sends an email to Alice saying at the end of the month whose salary to increase and decrease. And when Alice receives that, she changes the amount you get paid. Darth pretends to be Bob and sends an email to Alice saying, I am the director, please increase the salary of Darth by 100,000 baht. So this is one user, Darth, the malicious user, pretending to be Bob. Darth sends a message to Alice, setting the source address to be that of Bob. Alice receives the message, thinks, OK, the email is from Bob. Therefore, I should increase the salary of Darth by 100,000 baht. Darth pretends to be someone else and performs an attack on the system. Any questions about a masquerade attack? How do we stop it? We can't really stop it. Okay, we cannot prevent someone from sending out a message in our network normally. Okay. But we can de 
detect? How can we detect it? Alice, th let's say it's an email. Alice receives an email. I don't have a demo today. Maybe next lecture. It's very easy to fake the source address of an email. That is, I send an email and say, from Tanara. And you receive it, and it's from Tanara. And for most people, it looks in the email client, it will say, from Tanara at SIT. It's very easy to fake the source address of an email. So in that case, we can't really prevent someone from sending fake messages. What we need to do is make it easy for Alice to detect. When Alice receives a message, she needs a way to be able to check, is this message really from Bob, or is it from someone pretending to be Bob? We need to somehow authenticate the sender of that message. And probably after the midterm, we'll look at some mechanisms for doing that. We'll, we'll start to introduce uh, hash algorithms, message authentication codes, and digital signatures will arrive at. That is, the source really needs to sign the message. In the same way with a piece of paper, you sign the message, give it to someone, and they know it's from you because they, the, the signet ac signature acts as some proof it's from you. Well, we need that in computer systems as well, that someone can send, create a message, sign it, such that when the receiver receives it, they can verify the signature to prove that it did come from the original source, not from someone else. So we'll see the mechanisms of digital signatures and related techniques in this course. It's an active attack. What if there was a no attack? How many messages do Bob, does Bob send if there was no attack here? Not Nothing. He sends nothing. Yeah, no messages. And of course, Alice doesn't receive a message if there was no attack. But the introduction of the attack in this case means Alice receives one message. That's, we say, we've altered the system behavior. This is an active attack. Something changes because of the attack. And there's a, a famous comic on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog because when you're communicating with someone on the internet, there's generally no built-in authentication mechanisms. There's no way normally with the, the normal internet protocols to confirm that the message that you're receiving from someone is who they say they are. Let's keep going through the next three. Replay attack. Uh, Bob is the director of SIT. Again, he sends a message to Alice. Increase the salary of DARF by 10,000 baht. Okay. Fine, that, that's an intended message. DARF did some good work. Increase the, mess, increase the salary of DARF by 10,000 baht. Alice, who works in the, the finance office, increases his salary for that month. That was normal operation. But DARF intercepted that message and took a copy. And next month, Darth takes a copy, that copied message and sends it on to Alice. The message was signed by Bob, the director. What Darth did was took a copy and replayed that same message sometime later. So the next month, Alice receives a message. It's from Bob. It's got Bob's signature. Alice confirms it's from Bob, saying increase the salary of Darth by 10,000 baht. So now in this next month, he gets a second salary increase. This is a replay attack, where the attacker intercepts a message, a, a, a valid message, and sometime later replays that message to achieve some, some goal, which is breaking the, the, the system. So sending a valid message at some time later is a replay attack. How do we stop it? Again, you can't stop replays normally. That is, it's easy for someone to intercept and you can't stop them from sending. Again, we need some way for Alice to detect that the first message was the original, the valid one, 
The second replayed message is just a copy of the original one. Let's ignore it. We can use some sequence number. If we receive two messages which have the same sequence number, ignore the second one. Or some timestamp. I receive the message and inside that message contains today's date. One month later, I receive that same message for the, the, the date from one month ago. Ignore that because it's too old. It becomes invalid after some time. So we'll see some mechanisms that deal with stopping replay attacks. Modification. Bob sends a message. Decrease Darth's salary by 10,000 baht. Darth, before that message gets to Alice, Darth intercepts, changes the word or the letters D, D E, to I N, from decrease to increase, and forwards the message on to Alice. Alice receives it and increases the salary. Okay, so this is modifying the message along the way. Darth must intercept. Note, it's different from before where they intercepted but the original travelled through to the destination. In this case, they must intercept and make sure the original doesn't get to Alice. And then modify and send on to Alice. Again, an active attack. Why is it active? What's changed? The, the contents has changed. If there was no attack, Bob sends a message, increase, uh, sorry, decrease the salary. Alice would receive a message, decrease the salary. With an attack, Bob sends a message, decrease the salary. Alice receives a message, increase the salary. Something has changed. The message has changed in this case. We call that an active attack. Last one, denial, denial of service. Alice has disappeared. Alice is a computer server, a website, for example. Bob normally accesses that website to get his job done, accesses the server to do things. Darth, a malicious user, does some things to overload the server. Maybe he sends many messages to the server so fast that the server overloads and it cannot process any messages from Bob. As a result, Bob can't do his normal job. This is a denial of service attack. It's an attack that denies the normal users access to the service or the server. How do we stop that? Very, very hard. It turns out it's very, very easy to perform denial of service attacks and quite difficult to stop it without disrupting the, the normal users. Let's just jump back to this summary of passive and active. So passive, we make use of information sent, but we don't change the system resources. We intercept and look at the message contents, but we do not change the message or we do not generate new messages. Traffic analysis, we just observe the messages being sent, the frequency, the timing. Passive attacks are hard to detect. Bob and Alice are communicating. It's hard for them to know that Darth is listening in and intercepting. So very hard to detect but quite easy to prevent by using encryption or adding some, uh, some extra messages to hide the behavior. Active attacks change the system resources or the system operation. They are hard to prevent. That is, it's hard to stop someone to send messages, but easier than the passive attacks to detect. So there's trade or there's, there's differences in terms of prevention and detection. So usually we try to prevent passive attacks and detect active attacks. Any questions on attacks? So a broad classification of the main types of attacks in computer networks and also relevant for most computer systems in general.
I will sometimes use the word, I will not use Darth very often, but we'll talk about the attacker or the malicious user. What other words do we hear for someone who does this? A hacker? A hacker is commonly used to refer to someone who is the attacker, but unfortunately the word hacker has other meanings, some nicer meanings. A hacker can be someone who, who plays with hardware to build new thing, uh, build new things out of existing things. So sometimes we avoid the word hacker, but an attacker, a malicious user, they don't need to be a bad person. Okay? It could be some law enforcement agency, some police force, for example, trying to detect and stop crimes. Just because they are the attacker or malicious user doesn't necessarily mean they are the bad person in the world. But just res with respect to the communications, they are doing something to, to perform an attack. So there are different types of attacks possible. We've mentioned some mechanisms, encryption, digital signatures, and there are other mechanisms. But some of those mechanisms come together to provide services. There are a couple of definitions, but I'll go direct to the third point here. Security services implement security policies and are implemented by security mechanisms. So what that means is we use different security mechanisms to provide a service to our users and that service is provided to achieve some policy and the policy is usually from some organization so the policy for SIT may be that uh, no, no one can see the grades of or no student can see the grades of any other student that could be the policy of the organization that every student's grades should be confidential to that student other students should, shouldn't be able to see, see them so that could be the policy. So we'd look at, okay, what security services do we need to implement that policy? And the next slide will list the security services. And those security services will implement using mechanisms. In this course, we will not talk too much about policies. We'll go direct to the services and then more details about the mechanisms. There are different types of services or different classification. This is six services which are commonly used uh, to talk about what we try to offer our users in securing a computer system. Some people have different names for them, but we, we will use these in this course and you will remember them because there will be quiz questions about them. They're important. These are the things that we want to provide our users if we operate a computer system. Authentication. We want some means for assuring that the person we're communicating with is who they say they are. So we saw there's an attack. If someone sends me a message, if they pretend to be someone else, I need some way to check that they are who they say they are. That service is called authentication. More precisely, we can talk about peer entity authentication. So when we're communicating between two entities, they are peers with each other. So when someone sends message to one entity, that entity wants to authenticate the other peer in the communications, the other entity. Sometimes we'd like to also authenticate the data, the data origin, that the data we don't care who it came from, but the data is correct. came from a valid origin. Uh, what's an example? Uh, an example of data origin authentication is that uh, some, some uh, emergency systems are deployed such that when there's an earthquake, the monitoring devices send out a message to people to say there's an earthquake here and maybe that means there's a, a tsunami coming. So you can evacuate. So there are 
there are computing devices so in the sea and monitoring that when they detect the earthquake they automatically send a message. When we receive such a message we would like to authenticate that that's uh, correct data. Okay? We'd like to authenticate that it's not fake data, that it's true data. It's not uh, some data that's made up that causes us to evacuate when we don't need to evacuate. So sometimes we'd like to authenticate the data uh, that the, it came from uh, a valid source. Another service we'd often, often like to provide in both computers and also computer networks is access control. Our computers have resources that we provide to users. We want to control who can access those resources. So we prevent unauthorized use of resources. For example, we have a website and some parts of that website are public to everyone. But some parts of that website uh, should be private and you need to log in to access that part of the website. The mechanisms to protect that part of the, the website is called access control. You use it commonly on computers, access control on files, access control uh, on, on different features in the computer. In computer networks, it's commonly, commonly implemented by firewalls. A firewall controls who can access a particular network. So that's a common service needed. Data confidentiality, of course, is, is quite common. We need to be able to protect the data from unauthorized disclosure. That is, often we want to make sure that no one else can see our data. Keep it confidential. That's a common one. Similar to that, or related, data integrity. We want to be able to make sure that the data that we receive is exactly as the source sent it. It's not modified along the way. It may, we maintain the integrity of the data. Availability, jumping to number six, making sure the system is accessible and available to the people who should be using it. So if it's a website that's used for uh, registration inside SIT, then it needs to be available during the registration period so all the students can register on time. If for some form of an attack it means the registration website is not available during last week, then there will be some severe disruptions in SIT. So availability is the service that we want to provide. It's to stop denial of service attacks. Number five, non-repudiation. This is the service of trying to stop people from denying communications took place. Consider we're using our computer network to perform financial transactions, exchange money, or pay for things. So what happens when you go into a shop and you buy something? How do you prove that you bought that or you've paid your money? A receipt. You give them money, they give you a receipt. And you can use that receipt as a form of proof to say that you've actually paid for this, this object that you're taking. We often want similar services in computer networks. We perform some transaction, we send a message, we'd like to let, be able to later prove, prove to others, that that message was actually sent, or from the other entity's perspective, that the message was received. For example, you need to submit your assignment by email to me. So you send the assignment to me. I don't get it. Or even worse, I'm a nasty teacher and I say, I don't like you. Oh, I didn't get your assignment. I'm going to give you a zero. What do you do? You need some way to prove that you did send it. Okay, so we'd like some way to prove that you did send it. Or the other way, uh, you, you send... Uh, yeah, you send... Um, what do we want? The opposite direction. You want to be able to prove that you received a message. Okay, some proof that you've received a message is the other thing. So non-repudiation is this service of trying to protect people or protect against denial 
of communications. Make it hard for someone to say, no, I didn't receive it, or no, I didn't send it. That's what non-repudiation is about. Security mechanisms, we use the mechanisms to try to implement these services and such that we prevent the attacks. So we use mechanisms to implement services such that the attacks cannot take place. There are many types of mechanisms. There's no one mechanism that provides all six services, so we need a combination. Most mechanisms make use of cryptography. The title of this course includes cryptography. And the next topic, and, and several topics following that, will look at what is cryptography, cryptographic techniques. This lists a few examples of mechanisms, but maybe the next table is a, is a nice summary, a nice place to almost finish. In the rows, we see, in this case, there are eight services. It splits some of them out. So authentication is split into two different services. Authentication of the, the peer and the authentication of the data origin. Uh, and confidentiali confidentiality is split into two. Confidentiality of the data stopping the release of the message contents and traffic flow confidentiality is stopping traffic analysis. Even if someone cannot see my messages, they can still analyze my traffic. So traffic co flow confidentiality is trying to make it such that someone cannot analyze my traffic. So they come together. Sort of. The columns show some common mechanisms used to implement those services. So to provide confidentiality, we commonly use what's called encipherment, or we usually just call encryption. We encipher the data or we encrypt the data. To provide authentication, we may use a combination of mechanisms. We use encryption or encipherment, digital signatures, which we need to explain in this course, and maybe some exchange of messages to authenticate the user. we'll see that there are mechanisms called data integrity which use encryption techniques and, and cryptographic techniques. So in this course we're going to go through really the cryptographic techniques to implement most of these mechanisms. These mechanisms then come together to implement these services that we want to provide our users. Questions? So, key points from this topic, CIA, uh, attacks, services. We haven't really got into the mechanisms yet. We've mentioned some, but we, I will not ask you in the quiz what are all the mechanisms, but what are the services, what are the attacks, passive versus active, and these general concepts of confidentiality, integrity, and availability are important. The next topic is about, uh, we move into cryptography. And the way that we study cryptography in this course is that there are many complex algorithms to encrypt information. Very hard to cover those algorithms. But they are based upon some principles that have been around for a long time. So the first part will we look at the old ciphers, the old algorithms for encrypting information. Old starting from several thousand years old. Caesar cipher, and then progress through some old 
Nowadays, they're ineffective ciphers. With computers, they're very weak, but they demonstrate different principles of how do we encrypt data. And we'll finish today with a, a, an example which will set us up for uh, next lecture. Here's some s encrypted data. Find the original data. This is a simple cipher. It's based on what's called the Caesar cipher, where we shift the letters. So we call this, it's not easy to solve quickly, but I think with a, a little bit of thought you will. We call this, this is the encrypted data. We'll give it the name ciphertext. We'll see this defined next uh, topic. Cipher, a cipher is an algorithm for encrypting and similar decrypting. So the encrypted form of our message is called ciphertext. In this case it's K-H-O-O-R. And to get this ciphertext I started with some plain text. We'll find that in a moment. The plain text is the original message, unencrypted. We encrypt it and we get ciphertext. And the most common form of encryption algorithms, the way that they work is that we take an algorithm called a cipher, and in this case the cipher we used is what's called the Caesar cipher. I always spell it wrong. Based on Julius Caesar, one of the Roman emperors. And we take the plain text, we apply an algorithm, the algorithm is called the cipher, in this case it's the Caesar cipher, and combine the plain text and a key, a secret key. And the key is secret. If you know the key, you can decrypt. If you don't know the key, you cannot decrypt. Well, that's the idea of encryption. In this case, the cipher is not so good that even if you don't know the key, I think you may be able to find what the plaintext was. So, I tell you that the ci cipher is the Caesar cipher. You may not know what it is yet. You will next lecture. Some of you do. The cipher text is K-H-O-O-R. Your challenge as the attacker is two things. Find the plain text. Even better, find the key. Because if you know the key, you can find the plain text. And the Caesar cipher is a cipher, if we think of the English alphabet, A through to Z, where the key determines the number of places we shift the character by to get the cipher text. For example, if the key is 3, the letter A as plain text is encrypted to get the letter A to B to C to D. The letter D is ciphertext. We shift A three positions to the right and we get D, so the output would be D as ciphertext. So, I will not ask you to guess the key. How many possible keys are there? So, the Caesar cipher, English alphabet, 26 letters. If we have a shift of zero, plain text letter of A becomes cipher text letter of A. So, if my message was security and I encrypt it with a key of zero, the cipher text is security. It's not so good encryption. But if I have a key of 1, it means the S in security is encrypted and shifted to the letter T. E in security is shifted one position to F, T, F, and so on. So the number of possible keys is 26 in this case. 
One of them is not so good. Zero. The key in this case is four from memory. Now find this plain text. Try. <laughs> Shift. Shifting up is for encryption. So encryption takes, say, the letter A, and if we shift by four positions, produces the letter E. Is that right? We move th to the right, shift up. So decryption should be the other way. I think I've made a mistake. The key wasn't four, it was three. <laughs> Sorry. Because if you decrypt, it doesn't make much sense. But Right, it's three. So be careful. You want to decrypt, not encrypt. Encrypt takes a letter, let's say A, a shift of three produces ciphertext of A goes to B, C, D. Okay, we go to the right. Decryption goes backwards. Right. K H O O R and a, a quick helper. Maybe. just so you can remember the alphabet, but the numbers makes it a little bit easier. We had K. A shift of three positions mean the input must have been H. If we start with H and shift it to the right three positions, we get K. Therefore, if we start with the ciphertext K, to get the original plain text, we must shift back the opposite direction to get H. So K decrypts to H, H decrypts to E. We had KHO, O decrypts to L. And we had R decrypts to O. Hello. Okay. We'll see that the challenge of the attacker is given some ciphertext, given the cipher. Find the key and or the plain text with encryption. We assume the attacker will know the ciphertext, the encrypted form. We also assume that they know the algorithm used. It's usually the practice that the algorithm is known to everyone. So the, the attacker knows it was Caesar cipher. We have K-H-O-O-R. The attacker has two challenges. Given that, find the key and or the plaintext. If you find the key, you can easily find the plaintext. If you find the plaintext, sometimes you can get back to the key, but not always, for different algorithms. So what we'll do on Friday, Friday is it? Yeah, Friday we will 
uh, look at ciphers similar to this, very simple ones, with some examples to start to demonstrate the concepts of encryption.